Good evening, everyone. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean at the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series, co-sponsored by the Haas Healthcare Association, John E. Martin Mental Health Care Challenge. I am honored to introduce and welcome back to campus a double bear in political science and law, Lee Steinberg. As chairman and founder of Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, Lee is best known for his work building athletes into stand-alone brands. And he has represented many of the most successful athletes and coaches in sport. With an unrivaled history of record-setting contracts, Lee has secured over $4 billion for his more than 300 pro-athlete clients. Not only is he a leader in his field, he's also a leader here at Berkeley. Lee served as co-chair of his 50th reunion campaign last year, and he was a recent participant in Berkeley Changemakers. He also told me before we got on the stage here that he was the president of, his, of the ASUC, of the student body, when he was an undergraduate here. Equally as noteworthy, Lee has distinguished himself as an exemplary leader of beyond himself. He has directed more than $800 million to various charities around the world. Lee has received many commendations for his philanthropic work, including being named Man of the Year over a dozen times by a variety of organizations. In addition to all this, Lee is also a best-selling author. His most recent book, The Agent, My 40-Year Career of Making Deals and Changing the Game, details his decades of dominance in the sports industry, as well as sheds light on his personal struggles to launch his comeback. At this point, you guys should all know that he was also the model for Jerry Maguire and Jerry Maguire, just in case you didn't know that. Thank you, Lee, for being here today. We really are so grateful for both your time and your willingness to share your professional and personal journey with all of us. I know there is so much that we will learn from tonight's discussion. And with that, I turn it over to Songwen Chen, MBA, MPH 2022, and co-president of the Haas Healthcare Association to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm just confirming y'all can hear. Yeah. Awesome. Wait, let's get started. I'm excited to be here. You once said, I think all of us in our lives can envision a world that we would like to have, and then realize it's better to light candles than to curse the darkness. For those unfamiliar with your story, can you share more about what you meant by that and a little bit more about your journey, not only as a sports agent, but personally as you dealt with the alcoholism and your path to sobriety? So the question was? <laughs> <laughs> Long question, yes, Does I know. You, to talk about that? Yes, please. Yeah, just your journey how we got to you as a sports agent, just some of the personal challenges and this path that you're on now. Got it. So I'm thrilled to be here at Haas, which I consider to be the best business school in the country, um, with uh, distinguished uh, uh, faculty and amazing students. And I welcome the students from um, equally august institutions um, and uh, from Harvard and uh, and the, and Warden and and um, so I grew up in Los Angeles came up to Cal Berkeley in the late 60s and um, this was the center of rock music and herbal substances and um, um, liberated men and women, and uh, it was the most exciting place in the country to be. 
I was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dormitory, and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm. And one of the students was Steve Bartkowski. And in 1975, he became the very first player picked in the first round of the National Football League draft. And um, he asked me to represent him. Well, there really wasn't any sports agentry then. Teams could just hang up the phone and say, we don't deal with agents, click. And so we got lucky. Bartkowski was the first pick in the first round. He got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. And when we arrived in Atlanta to sign the contract the next day, there were Klieg lights flashing in the sky. A huge crowd was pressed up against the police line. And the first thing we heard was, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Uh, Steve Bartkowski and Lee Steinberg have arrived. We switch you live, live. So I had been raised by a father who uh, raised us with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was try to make a meaningful, positive impact in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. And I saw then that the athletes could be role models. And if they retrace their roots to the high school community and set up a scholarship fund, Boys and Girls Club, work with inner city kids, or at the university level, they came back and repaid their scholarship and bonded with those alums, um, they could be mentored and they could lay the foundation for second career. And at the pro level, we challenge each athlete to find something in their own life that they would like to tackle. And then put together a charitable foundation with the leading business figures, political figures, and community leaders to help project a program. So that's work done. Uh, who ran for Tampa and Atlanta, putting the 175th single mother and the family in the first home they'll ever own. And uh, by making the down payment and outfitting it. It can be Patrick Mahomes giving uh, through his 15 in the Mahomes to a whole <laughs> variety of children's charities. But it's athletes making a difference and they also can message. And in messaging, I had the heavyweight champion, Lennox Lewis, cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. And that could do more to trigger behavioral change in rebellious adolescents than a thousand authority figures. So I had a pretty charmed uh, life. This is, well, next year will be my 48th draft. But sometime in the 2000s, um, a, a series of things happened. My two kids were diagnosed with something called retinitis pigmentosa, which is an eye disease that leads to narrowing and ultimately blindness. Um, my father died along a uh, death of cancer. Um, we lost a home in a beachside city to mold and had to raise it to the ground. And um, I was okay handling anything in my uh, work life. I understood there'd be adversity and life will knock you back and you can do anything you want. It won't really uh, always turn out wonderful. But I felt like Gulliver sitting on the beach, tethered down with no ability to solve these problems with little Laputian sticking forks in me. And I turned to the wrong thing, I turned to alcohol. And I eventually devolved to a point where um, I gave my practice away I, uh, to the younger lawyers. Um, I closed down my home. Um, and I went to live at my parents' house at 61 years of age. And the only thought as I sat on my father's bed was, where can I find more alcohol? Where can I find more vodka? And I had an epiphany in that moment that um, I wasn't a starving peasant in Darfur. I didn't have the last name Steinberg in Nazi Germany in the late 30s. I wasn't crippled. So what excuse did I have to not live up to that? And um, so I went off to sober living, uh, worked a 12-step program with a unique fellowship, and uh, 
if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'll, uh, uh, in a couple months, uh, be 12 years continuously sober. It is better to light candles than a curse darkness. Lee, thank you for sharing that. On that journey, can you share more about some of your major allies? Can you share about any advice that you might have for others going through similar challenges? So I think the key in life, the critical skill is your ability to hone your listening skills. It's the ability to cut below the surface and um, understand the deepest anxieties and fears of another person and their greatest hopes and dreams. But it requires creating trust and stillness around another human being. So they'll cut below the surface and peel back the layers of the onion mm -hmm. so that they get deeper and deeper and you actually bond. You know, we wear masks very often, not these, but emotional masks. And those masks stop people from realizing the commonality of their problems. And so when people don't talk about mental health, then they assume that they uniquely are having this problem, that there's no, uh, they're the only person in the world. But if we ever shared that and we're open about it, so I've always said that mental health is health. It's health. And it's just another form of it. And if we can take the stigma away from that mm -hmm. and message in a way so that I've had athletes who I encourage to speak out um, on mental health issues and to talk about the fact that they're hurting or they're depressed or they're bipolar or whatever they are. But it takes some courage in a very macho world to, to do that. But it's so important. I've been open about my alcoholism in the hope that someone out there who's struggling and um, uh, impacted, is hopeless and desperate, will realize that help is available. And we need to do exactly the same thing with mental health because um, um, it's treatable for the most part. And um, I'm so proud of all the students here who've come up with different ways to, to create treatment, to create awareness. But um, one of the things that we talked about earlier today was could you do a week of television like they did about smoking, where every single dramatically scripted uh, show and comedic show that ran for a week had mental health woven into their plot and somehow, again, removed the stigma and talked about the very real challenges that people face. That resonates. Lee, thank you so much. Thank you for your bravery and transparency and sharing about that. What you say about destigmatizing and raising awareness, it lands. And, you know, I, I could have mentioned this earlier, but grateful for everyone coming here as part of our mental health care challenge and appreciate all that you're doing and sharing your stories, being creative, being innovative, and being brave. Lee, let's pivot a little bit. Back to the sports world. As the global dialogue on mental health continues to be amplified, its intersections with athletics and sports definitely gaining more traction. Withdrawals from competition by Naomi, Naomi Osaka, Simone Biles, right, to awareness efforts led by Michael Phelps that we talked about earlier, NBA players DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love. I think society just has a far better appreciation of these dynamics, some of them you just spoke to. What's going on with this trend? Can you comment on what factors made it so challenging previously and where we're going now with becoming more authentic and more vulnerable? So you now know that athletes have access to social media. And so they're expressing opinions all the time. And they brand. So the social currency today for an athlete is how many followers you have on Twitter, Instagram, uh, God forbid, TikTok, um, uh, <laughs> Snapchat, 
Um, and I can't dance, but um, <laughs> but at any rate, it's it's uh, so that's the currency. So they're able to define themselves as they choose um, in a variety of different ways. Thank goodness for Naomi Osaka, and uh, thank goodness for that wonderful uh, you know Simone Biles, because what they did in a worldwide forum was to talk about the problems they were having and uh, not be afraid. And it's liberating for people to, to hear that because, again, you feel isolated, alone um, in a world. I suffered when I was younger, still suffer from low-level depression. I'm not talking about debilitating, like I could get out of bed, but there were times when the world turned dark and it was hard to see uh, where the hope was and where the future was. And uh, so I started using antidepressants, Prozac, and uh, I haven't had that problem since. And, and oh my God, thank you for my life back because uh, it was just uh, episodic. Um, so we can design programs for athletes. If any of you, uh, I don't know if there are any football fans here, but Fox uh, pregame did an interview with an offensive lineman from the Green Bay Packers, and Jay Glazer did it, and he talked about his problems with depression. And we can do more of that. We can do more of that. And athletes especially have the ability, as I said before, to trigger imitative behavior, especially in young. They are larger than life. Mm -hmm. Whether they should be role models or not is, I believe they should be role models, but the point is we can have them do all sorts of public service announcements. And, and um, um, like I talked about, a week on TV, we can start to be creative in terms of how we model this and um, I want my athletes to lead the way. Hmm. I agree. I think the opportunity for these athletes, many of them, as you say, larger than life, there's so much opportunity for them to champion, to lead. How do we continue this? Right, how do we ensure that those support systems are there so that they can continue? Say the last part again. How do we continue this? How do we ensure that athletes grow more comfortable sharing their experiences? Right, I'm thinking support systems. I got you. Can it be the league? Can it be players associations? So we have to take the structure of pro sports and collegiate sports. And that means leagues, individual franchises, Players associations, um, agents have the same responsibility. And every person that interacts has to be on board. Mm. So we have to get buy-in from all those groups so that, um, look, what's an athlete afraid of? Um, you'll think he's weak or she is weak. And you'll um, start to think of them a different way if you have as crazy or demented or not all there. And they'll lose their place on the team if they have to miss any time. And so for an athlete, long-term health is an abstraction. They live in a world of denial. So um, I've been fighting the concussion fight for 30 years now. And because uh, when we first went to doctors and asked how many are too many, what's the magic number? They had no answers. And so I've held 17 concussion conferences. Here's the problem. Athletes have been taught from Little League and Pop Warner to ignore pain, that real men don't complain, not to get left out of the unit. And the only people who share those values are, are people in the service, Army people, you know, Navy, Marines. They, both are young groups of young people, and they're in total denial. So let's say that if in your and my reality, the key would be long-term health, 
and way beneath that as a value would be um, playing a pro career. And way below that as a value would be playing in a given season. And way below that, the ability to play in a given game. The athlete turns that on their head. The play is everything. I have to play this play. So you have young people's denial, right? And then you've got athletic denial. So you've got young people in an athletic group, so it's den denial cubed or squared. <laughs> um, and it's very difficult to penetrate, but we're, we can do this through enlisting at the collegiate level athletic directors, chancellors, different people that, that, and the medical staff that treats the players, the trainers that treat the players. I have to be very systematic and organized about the way in which we integrate these concepts. That it's okay to talk about mental health problems, it's okay to seek treatment, and, and you can get better. Yeah, thank you. That, that dichotomy between the short term, that next play, and long-term health, it's a challenge. And what you said about rallying all the stakeholders, ADs, trainers, uphill battle. So, um, Songwen, think about the fact that I would call an athlete up who got a concussion in a game, and I would say, the first thing you need to do is rest. The second thing you need to do is be asymptomatic on a exercycle. The third thing is asymptomatic at practice. And only then can you consider going into a game. And don't, if you got one and it was, it took that, the second one is like that. And uh, so I'd call up whoever, Ben Roethlisberger or someone, um, and they would play anyway. So, you know, it's a battle, but um, it's one worth having, and it's, you got to keep chipping away at it. But again, take the structure of high school, collegiate, and professional sports, and at each level permeate the um, uh, leadership there. And uh, it's like the way we tackled bullying. Um, I got college players to talk to high school players about tolerance and said, if you guys lead the way at this high school, and instead of, you know, making fun of someone who's got a hair lip or is overweight or is this race or is whatever, you put your arm around them, you can change the culture in that high school really quickly because athletes sit atop the food chain. So it's looking at every level of how people get information, what formulation there is of their attitudes. And we need to teach about mental health in elementary school and junior high and, and, and high school and all the way through. Thank you for that and agree. It is a comprehensive approach, right? Uphill battle, worth having, worth having those allies as a sports agent, as an advocate. I want to talk a little bit more about the broader, the broader agent industry, excuse me, and the job, your job as a sports agent. I think you answered one of the questions I had coming up actually about you know, requiring the athletes that you represent to create structured plans to give back to their communities. I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that, but also comment on how this has benefited those athletes beyond the realm of just public relations and branding? So I was raised by a father who said that when you see a problem in the world, and it could be as minor as picking this glass up or trash, it could be as major as uh, bad police shootings and uh, inner city uh, uh, circumstances, it can be the environment or whatever, and you wait for they or them to solve the problem. So who are they or them? They're older people, they're political figures, they're business leaders. He would say, you could wait forever. The they is you, son. You are the they. So if you take that sense of individual responsibility, the enemy for athletes is self-absorption. 
being part of a little teeny community of other athletes where they have are disconnected from everything else. So the key is I'll ask an athlete in the first session, um, what skills or aspirations do you have other than athletic ones so that you can try to design that? Now, self-absorption is like, well, enough about me. Can we talk about how you feel about me? <laughs> That's self-absorption. So the um, key is to get an athlete seeing himself as an active actor, empowerment, empower them to be, you know, uh, uh, responsible and, and develop different things so you can get them to be leaders by, if, if you sit and talk with the athletes, some of them had a parent who had mental illness. Someone had mental illness themselves. Some of them had someone who suffered from sickle cell anemia or Tay-Sachs or something or, or, or inner city kids or single mothers. And it's ferreting that out. And then we put, again, a charitable foundation that's got the leading business figures uh, political figures and community leaders to help execute that program. So it's making sure that at least the athletes I work with understand how they become empowered, how they can take control of their own life so that second career is not a kind of death to them. Yeah, what you said about empowering them, that resonates. How do they continue to give back and be role models? Let's stay within the sports industry, but shift more to the job as a sports agent. Can you comment on some of the diversity challenges and opportunities within the sports agent industry? Can you comment a little bit more about how we get to a place where athletes are represented more by people who look like them and come from the same backgrounds? Yes. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important in sports that we have minority ownership. And we d just don't have enough of it. You know, it's basically lily white ownership. So that's important because the same way it was important for President Obama to be president because then you get a young kid not aspiring to be an athlete, but aspiring that you can be president of the United States, that you can be a business leader, that you can be this, that. So it's important to have that. Um, we need more executives um, to, to, and more diversity. Well, we have our first female general manager who's from Viet, Vietnamese uh, background. Um, we need uh, more coaches, more head coaches to be that. Now to do this, you've got to start the pool much earlier. So when I was representing Warren Moon, um, who was a Hall of Fame quarterback who had to go to Canada t for six years before he could come back into a prejudiced NFL, um, the question was, how are we going to solve this problem of having these gifted athletes not playing this position because of prejudice? So the key was to get high school uh, African-American quarterbacks that were six foot four not to switch to play tight end or something or another sport, but to play drop back passing quarterback. You have to create the supply enough. So if we're trying to create diversity, we need training programs, whatever it is, internships, places where we're creating a big enough pool that, that we can um, uh, make this happen. Because again, everyone in sports is a role model. Um, um, and as to the representation of, uh, I mean, we have African-American agents who work with us. We have female agents who work with us. We have an Asian-American uh, uh, who works with us. Um, I'm trying to create, with a woman I have now, the first great female sports agent, because um, I think that's important, too. And when we hit these breakthroughs, remember, when I was growing up, there were no women in broadcast news. Can you imagine? No women in broadcast news. Forget a sports writer. Forget all of that. And then these, 
the ceiling gets broken, and then we don't even remember that that was ever true. Um, and uh, so it's it's you have to work consistently on diversity, and you have to remain committed to it, and you have to be clever and creative. Agreed. So one of the things we do is we have an agent academy, but we also have a sports career conference. And there we bring, where I'm trying to mentor the next generation of talented sports professionals who have ethics and values and don't use, I was talking with the dean about the concept of situational ethics. So part of what's wrong with this society is that people use one set of ethics to be a nice father, to be a good neighbor, to be nice to cats and dogs, and then go out in the workplace and use heinous social Darwin tactics. Um, because after all, the end justifies the means, right? And that leads to a bifurcation and a type of soul death, right? Because if you're maintaining these two antithetical values um, and operating in different parts of your life, it, it creates a um, dissonance that is, is very difficult. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Lee. Thinking back to the question about challenges and opportunities, agree that it's comprehensive, it's systemic, it's upstream. Further downstream, thinking about what you said about the great uh, sports agents. Staying within the industry here, can you share more about the biggest differentiator between successful sports agents today compared to those when you helped build the industry? Yes. Um, well, if Rip Van Winkle had gone to sleep when I started <laughs> and awoke today, he'd be in culture shock because <laughs> None of you will remember this, but we lived in a world where um, if you called somebody on the phone and they didn't answer, it rang busy, okay? <laughs> and uh, there were no cell phones, there was no uh, computers, <laughs> there was, uh, you had to have a roll of quarters to go to a pay phone. That's a phone that you put money in to pay for. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, totally different. So teams at that stage in the NFL made $2 million as their share of the national TV contract. Last year, they made $200 million per team per season. And they just did a new contract for 10 years that will, uh, and uh, some art of him. And um, you could, like art, you could get one of 50 and buy that, or you could buy one individual one. So we put him up for charity for uh, 20 minutes, and he sold $3.2 million worth of this. Now, it doesn't exist except on your computer screen, OK? <laughs> so get that. If you can get that thinking and understand um, uh, where, where we are, it's now you have NILs on campus. And since July 1st, the whole world of college athletics has turned upside down. And um, so now, where I would talk to a football player, they would have to be three years on campus to come out in the draft, right? So you'd start talking to them right as they go into that third year. Today, high school players can sign NILs. So it moves the whole time frame. You know, uh, again, pretty soon I'll be uh, uh, going to, you know, maternity wards trying to <laughs> s sign uh, uh, young kids. So um, babies and, uh, you know, they'll burp twice. But um, so the, the key in all this is the world just revolutionized and changed. So we've got a whole generation, not that any of you would be part of it, but a whole generation that is brought up on big screen color and sound and fast cutting and multitasking and, and stuff swimming over you, the concept of imagination, that you would go out in the yard and find a box and, and uh, create a game, no more. So. The social media has figured out really cleverly how to addict 
uh, young people to likes and to, to text responses. They'll go absolutely crazy if not enough people like that. Oh my God, it's a rejection of me as a human being. No one liked me in the last 10 seconds. So it means I got to get whatever I'm doing. It attenuates attention span. It subverts the concept of patience. And so one of the things you got to do today, Songwin, is get it out fast. Mm. If you think an athlete's sitting there for an hour listening to this elongated pitch, they're not, you know. So you uh, uh, better talk fast or uh, condense. So it's a different generation of, of Gen Z. Absolutely. Absolutely different generation, different innovations, revolutions, innovation, non-fungible tokens, as you say, and see how the name, image, and likeness law manifests over time. Lee, let me ask you one final planned question for you. Thank you for sharing all that you did. Appreciate that we covered all these important themes for mental health, advocacy. A lighter question. Aside from the obvious, Jerry Maguire, what's your favorite sports movie? <laughs> My favorite sports movie goes well before your time. It would be, there's a movie called Pride of the Yanks. Um, every sports movie based on a true story that has an aspirational curve to it that goes from conflict and, and failure to, to the uh, fruition makes money all day long. <laughs> and so after I worked on Jerry Maguire, which was loosely based on me, um, then I worked on uh, a movie called Any Given Sunday. Mm -hmm. And um, um, they had, a rap guy was supposed to play the quarterback in it, but he couldn't throw the football. So I was technical advisor. So they said, what do you think of him throwing a football? I said... When I went to Berkeley, there were powder puff quarterbacks who could throw better than he could. So um, I said, you can't use him unless you want to double him in every scene. So um, they fired him, and it gave a young comedic actor his first dramatic role, and that was Jimmy Fox. So that was a fun one. Wow. Uh, so my favorite... Um, Oh, I, th I love them. They're, I thought The Blind Side was great. Mm. Um, it's, uh, I thought Radio was great. I thought um, uh, Hoosiers was great. I thought um, the Denzel Washington uh, uh, film, oh Roman my Titans. God, he's yeah. anything he does, yeah. Awesome. Lee, thank you so much. Thank you oh, so much for you. sharing. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, we now have an opportunity for Q some Q&A. So if some of you would like to ask a question, you can go to the mic um, in the back. Uh, and that way, people who are viewing this um, possibly online can also hear the question. So. And please identify yourself. Sure. Uh, Hey, Lee, thanks for coming. Thanks for the time. My name is Mohammed. I'm an MBA student here. Uh, I wanted to follow up on uh, doing more for athletes, what you were talking about, particularly ex-athletes. Uh, average NFL career, I think, is something like three years. NBA is something like four years. So what's being done for that population, the ex-athlete population? And who do you think, uh, is there any one group that's better positioned, I guess, to do something more for them than anybody else? Could you repeat the question, Anne? Did you? Oh, hear? you want me to repeat the question? Um, Mohammed is asking, uh, what is being done for athletes after they terminate their career as an athlete? Is that the question? That's right, particularly yes. for mental health and for sort of right. for the financial health. support or something. For mental health? Right. Um, not enough is the first answer. Um, but it... Um, it's, it's all in the preparation of it. So if I've done my job right, I ought to pick up the fact that someone's depressed or bipolar or whatever they are early enough that we can get them help. Um, they've got the same stigma 
and worry, you know, to be open and honest about it. Um, but teams are actually fine and you'd be pleased for how they are. They've got access to the best mental health professionals. Uh, people are dying to work for the teams. So the whole thing is to get them to be open and not have the thing be discovered in the course of a bad incident, right? In other words, the time to discover that is not when you have someone in domestic violence or in a, a fight or in a you know, drunk driving or whatever it is. The time to discover it is early. So we need to do a better job of getting our team physicians and trainers to bring this out. And the players worry that it'll be in their health records, right? And it might be somehow used as a reason to obviate a guarantee or not pay them or, you know, do whatever. So not enough, but um, it's, um, um, if they can pick it up early enough, we have pretty effective techniques, but a lot of times it doesn't come out until something horrible happens. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Angel. I'm an MBA student from the East Coast. I wanted to thank you for your time. We've spoken a lot about athletes and about agents. I'd love to hear your perspective on another stakeholder in the ecosystem, specifically investors and financiers, given this is a business atmosphere. What are the types of structural issues that have incentivized investors to make conflicting decisions that might come at the cost of athlete mental health? And even agents, if agent compensation is tied to athlete contract, do you feel like your role has pushed you to make decisions that might have encouraged you know, adverse outcomes for athletes? And can you just paraphrase? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, delighted to. I think the question is, is for investors as well as for agents, might they have the wrong incentives um, because of the system to, to support solutions to mental health? Yes. Beautifully they, said. They, they, um, so look, I mean, for years, it was shut up and play. Um, in other words, the point is that put it under the rug. You know, to own a professional sports team, you know, the Dallas Cowboys are now worth $5 billion. So if you were to lose a key player for a mental health issue and he couldn't perform, we have something called a salary cap now. So that means that starters, starting players, make huge amounts of money, but their backups are very uh, relatively weak. Um, and free agents are people playing for the lease. So the institution wants a player out playing. The investor wants a player out playing. And um, they just as soon not know. Um, so that's the impediment, which is um, uh, the standard is so different. And um, what a team wants is productivity on the field. They, in general, as a business, they're not in the mental health uh, business. So that's why we have to sensitize them uh, to it. And for the advantages, and then other modalities. Um, I was talking today um, about hyperbaric oxygen and a process called RTMS that helps people with concussions and other uh, depression. Um, light stem and uh, all the rest of it. So we have to be innovative in the techniques we use with these athletes because the cutting edge of biomed is far ahead of the regular standard of medicine. Hello, Lee. My name is John. I teach accounting here. Um, and he UCLA. teaches what? And accounting. He teaches accounting. accounting. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question about, you mentioned um, Simone Biles and uh, Naomi Osaka. Um, dealing with their mental health, they did get some pushback from some folks on social media. How would you counsel athletes to deal with that? Just stay off social media or how, how would they 
um, cope with the need to look after mental health and uh, without? Well, the first thing is to be really clear about what the state of their mental health is, because by the time Simone Biles is deciding she can't compete, people have already judged her, you know, they, they're not thinking of it in a larger way. If you could get out in front of that, having a press statement or, or either a statement, a press conference, something that says, look, I've given my whole life to gymnastics and I've given my whole life to, uh, for, to support American gymnastics and I've spent all these years preparing for this so it's a crushing blow not to be able to do this but I don't want to be 100 feet high in the air and discover I can't flip and, and break my neck. So it's to try to humanize that issue um, and get it across um, in palpable ways that people can relate to in their own lives. And it's, um, look, all some people want to do is win the Olymp beat other countries in the Olympics so we can brag about it. But there are larger issues, right? And um, so it's just being able to make that case which was difficult at first with Simone because it was just happening and she didn't know that she'd be unable to perform, so you didn't have any lead time. But in the best of all worlds, you could have sort of drawn that out of her ahead of time so you'd have some notice. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings, Mr. Steinberg. I am Wycliffe Florizart, a one-year professional MBA candidate currently studying at the Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. So um, you have a vision of treating mental health like any other form of health, but I think mental health is a little different from any other form of health. Like for example, like if I'm bleeding or if I break a bone, like I know I have to go to the doctor. Um, so my question to you is where do we draw the line between someone who needs help from a mental standpoint and someone who is actually mentally healthy? So what was that last distinction? Where do you draw the line? What? Between. So, where do we draw the line between someone who actually needs, like, you know, help from a mental um, standpoint versus someone who actually is mentally healthy? I believe the question is he's trying to ask, and correct me if I'm misinterpreting here, but where is that line drawn? Which determining one? when somebody needs help with their mental health versus is there even a mentally healthy? Is that fair? Yeah, that's a fair, that's, that's a fair way to put it. Okay. So some would argue that we're all mentally unhealthy <laughs> in this society, yeah. and especially after last year of uh, the pandemic. I would leave that up to the professionals. So I would call into a, you know, a psychologist or someone else and get a second opinion. Um, I'm a lay psychologist, but <laughs> not a real one. So you really have to go to the experts you know, to, to draw the line. If it's enough that it's troubling them and they're talking about it, then it's, it's enough. And Remember, the thing about mental health is everyone has amazing sympathy for someone wearing a cast, right? Oh, my God, you broke your arm. Oh, my God, is this? You can't see mental illness, except if someone's walking down Telegraph Avenue talking in tongues or something. I mean, you can identify that there are people walking around on streets that have problems, but you're going to have to rely on the experts. And... Um, you know, f my point is, first, don't do any harm, so I don't want to. Um, um, but but I'd, a I'd ask an expert. Thank you. Hi, Lee. My name is JP, and I'm a first-year MBA student. So since you started your career, the NFL has changed pretty dramatically, but you stuck around. I'm pretty, very impressed by your longevity. Can you talk about some of the principles you've carried through your career that have allowed you to sustain your success? Thank you. So if you, I, the first thing I tell people to do is an internal inventory of what values are most important. 
So how do you how does short term economic gain feature in your life or long term economic security or the ability um, or family or geographical location or autonomy or you know making a difference in the world or whatever. So if you have clarity as to what your own values are, um, the most consistent theme is uh, helping people. So it's clear to me I could do that in two ways. I could stimulate the best values in people, but all I'm doing is inheriting usually the parents' work who have done such a great job. And the second is what together can we do to make an impact in the world? like the Sporting Green Alliance or the uh, whatever we've taken on. And um, um, what has always saved me is resilience. It's life will knock you back. It knocks all of us back. You're not going to succeed in everything. You're going to have untoward circumstances that happen. And it's human to get destabilized a little bit. but. You know, I'm the guy who, if there's uh, a barn filled with uh, horse poop defecation, um, uh, I'm sure there's a pony in there somewhere. It's got to be there somewhere, you know. <laughs> so it's a sense of optimism and, and not giving up in the face that the world didn't change totally, notwithstanding our best efforts, that I couldn't totally do it. But it's um, feeling... Money's not a part of it. I mean, it's, it's, it, my father, if I came home and told him that I did a contract for a zillion dollars, he'd say, gee, that's great. I hope the player's happy. Um, but if I told him that, you know, we just did a program that helped inner city kids or, you know, establish a police uh, community dialogue that resulted in people being safer, He'd throw his arms around me. So the consistent principle has been trying to make a difference in a positive way in the world. And uh, it's uh, so I wrote a book on the art of negotiating called Winning with Integrity. And the whole key was when you watch human beings interact, if you can't establish a paradigm of cooperation, then people will get locked into positions. And when they get locked in, it's really hard to get them out. So the point is, in human interaction, you have to find a way to establish trust and, and the rest of it. So um, my thing has been not to care about myself, but to care what I can do to enhance other people's lives. I'm fine. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a PhD student in statistics sort of on the East Coast at Duke University. I'm more of an NBA junkie myself. Um, in the past few years, there have been a lot of all-star level players who have spoken out about mental health struggles, Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, and most recently, there's been a lot of media attention on the Philadelphia 76ers with Ben Simmons and the recent mental health struggles that he's been going through there's this prevailing sentiment within the media and maybe popular culture that maybe he's almost like faking some of his issues or the Philadelphia 76ers aren't doing enough to support him. There's two sides of the issue. My question for you is, how do teams balance providing mental health resources for athletes and being understanding of their personal situations in the backdrop of million dollar contracts, billion dollar TV deals? How do they find, strike the right balance in doing this? Thank you. So I think the key is um, introspection at the beginning of a career. It's clarity as to who they are and what their goals are. And just surrounding themselves with people who will tell them the truth. Okay? So um, if, if an athlete was up on a 90-story building on the ledge and he was about to jump, He'd be surrounded by sycophants and toadies and posses and other people who'd say, law of gravity doesn't apply to you. You know, you the, you're the man. Go ahead and, you know, you can fly. 
Um, so the harder part in working with athletes is telling them the truth, is being willing to, you know, to pound them over the head, but you can't let them be oblivious to what they're facing. You've got to have the courage in that relationship to actually help the person, not just worry about would they fire you or would they be angry if you suggested that they could use some counseling or some help. And so, um, um, again, like I said, self-absorption is the problem. And if you can bring someone out of that, um, it's, uh, it's my players are going to, except if your name is Tom Brady, are going to you know have their career over in the 30s, some of them earlier. So the question is what, what else are your skills? What else are your talents? And moreover, if you substitute newspaper clippings and um, profile and material things for any inner spiritual sense or any way of being balanced, um, those all fade. Newspaper clippings fade, fame fades. One of the problems that athletes have in second career is they're used to structure. They're used to being told, this is what you're doing this hour, this hour, this hour. This is what you're doing in the calendar. You know, follow your itinerary. They're used to structure. And they're surrounded by camaraderie band of brothers or sisters that's amazing. And so all of a sudden they get divorced from that. They have no structure unless you've career planned with them. They have no structure and and they're not surrounded every day by this group of people that they believe will cover their derriere, right? So balance is critical and you have to be willing you know, when they say speak truth to power, you have to be willing to speak truth to, to clients if you, if you really have a fiduciary responsibility to them. Thank you so much for your answer. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, thank you, Ann. <laughs> uh, Lee, thank you for being here. My name is Bill. I'm a member of the faculty here at Haas. And you talked about NILs for college athletes and even high school athletes. I'm curious to know your thoughts on Overtime Elite and other programs like it that are um, basically recruiting uh, high school athletes and, and turning them pro. Um, so I'm interested to know your thoughts on what it does for your business, but also for you personally. Do you see yourself in the uh, sitting in the living room of a 16-year-old athlete talking to his or her parents uh, in the future? Can you? Uh, the question is: is as as um, opportunities come to younger and younger athletes, um, will sports agents soon be sitting in the uh, living rooms of 16-year-olds? Uh, athletes so generally that relationship happens I, I don't see myself doing that I mean it's uh, the beauty of the clients I have is they're you know when you go to college you may argue that athletes didn't take the same course as they did this but I am telling you your average football player was on a college campus exposed to different things and they are reasonably sophisticated, okay, compared to a player who comes out of high school and goes into the minor leagues. And so I don't see myself um, being involved with that, except if it was an Olympic athlete, um, because they're just competing in, in the deal. But it's a, it's a hard, um, generally the way that, the fortunate athletes have their parents involved as screeners. So you're not really talking to the athlete. You're talking to the parents or to a third party. And that, to me, so I may never talk to a college football player until he's ended his last season. And I'm just talking to the parents. And uh, 
So representing Tua Tongo by Loa, um, I'm talking to his parents. So um, that I'm okay to do, you know. Um, again, if a 16-year-old gymnast came to me and was going to be in that profile anyway, I could see it. But the rest of it, it's just too young. And plus, I don't think they're great candidates for role modeling and, and all the rest of it quite yet. They haven't lived enough of life to be <laughs> to telling other people. So um, NILs are all over the country. They thought it was going to be just the stars, but it's not. It's whole schools. And alums are using it to use their businesses like Phil Knight to enrich an entire program, right? So alums own a business. The business signs a bunch of players to NILs, and all of a sudden they've, they've uh, re-energized their uh, program. And programs are using that in recruiting. I never thought I'd see the day that Nick Saban, a very conservative University of Alabama football coach, would say of his unproven, untested freshman quarterback that normally he would keep expectations down for, okay? You don't want to put more pressure on this. And he came out in a press conference and said, Bryce Young has signed a million dollars worth of deals. In what alternative universe, what, you know, did Nick morph into something? No, he's recruiting is what he's doing. He's saying, you come to Alabama, you can make a million dollars. I don't want to be part of that. Like, I'll give you an example. The first two years of Patrick Mahomes' career, we did virtually no marketing deals. We wanted to prove to the people of Kansas City that the engine that pulls the train is performance and allow his career to develop. And so... I didn't take Bryce Young as a client. I thought he was too young. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Song Wen. Thank you to Lee. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, if there are any questions, I'm sure uh, Lee might will be willing to talk to you afterwards uh, for a couple minutes. Really, we really appreciate you going beyond yourself and sharing your experiences with us. We feel very, very honored today. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you.